Good morning, Cloverland and world. Glad that you are here with us again and joining us for our Sunday morning worship. We ought to be grateful and thankful of the many blessings God has uh, brought in our lives. And we also ought to uh, be, be thankful that he has woke us up again on this lovely, lovely day to, be, to, to, to worship him in spirit and in truth. And I, I'm excited to, 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 to be here and, and to proclaim God's truth to you this morning. If you're a visitor, we want to say that you're our honored guest. We are delighted to have you. Always remind, I want to remind you, always subscribe to our, our YouTube pages and follow us on our social media sites, on our Facebook, Twitter, uh, uh, Instagram, and Twitter page. And we encourage you to, to leave comments, and uh, we, 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 be, we be encouraged by our visitors. And so we encourage you to do that. You are more than welcome. We're always welcoming our visitors as well. We want to also say uh, happy Mother's Day uh, to our mothers out there in the world. Uh, uh, you, this is your special day, and we are grateful. Uh, and I know many are with their mothers today, and many may have lost their mothers already, but we want to encourage you today. And uh, matter of fact, I brought a couple of roses with me today, and I want to say this is for you. These roses are for you today, and we are, uh, want to uh, remember you and, uh, and the things you have uh, done for us in our lives. Uh, uh, throughout uh, throughout our lives, and we just want to be encouraged, and so we want to say Happy Mother's Day to the world, and God bless you. These roses are for you. I want to throw them to you if you don't let me. And hopefully, you'll catch them in your living room or wherever you're watching our our our, our uh, service today. Amen. We want to say again, thank you for joining us here at the Cloverland Church of Christ. I'm Brother. Uh, Darius Woods, I'm the minister here at the Cloverland Church of Christ, and we want to say that we are going to have a wonderful time in the Lord. Uh, our order of worship will be a, a, a starting prayer, and we'll open up in a prayer. We'll have two song selections by a song leader, and <coughs> we'll have a uh, scripture reading and uh, a, a meditation and prayer with following our lesson, as well as our communion and giving. Again, thank you for joining us this morning. God bless. If you don't mind, go to, uh, go to prayer with me uh, to our Heavenly Father, please. Dear Father God, we again thank you for this day. Just thank you for allowing us to be here. Uh, just giving us another day, a day that wasn't promised to any of us, and we ought to be grateful and, and joyful in it. Father, we want to uh, thank you for those who have come to join us today in our virtual worship. We just ask that you continue to bless their lives, be with them in the uh, in the best way you know how, continue to guard their hearts in, in Christ Jesus. And, and if they're not, uh, they're seeking uh, uh, you, we just, open, we just ask that you open their hearts and minds and uh, uh, that they're may, maybe to seek your truth and, and seek the gospel of Christ and, uh, and ask what must, they be say, what, what must they do to be saved. We just hope and pray that we, we be a, a vessel and a tool that you, you're able to use while we're, while we're here on earth. Continue to bless the Cloverland Church of Christ. Bless us collectively and individually. Bless all the mothers today. Uh, we are just grateful of them and their sacrifices they have made on our lives and in our world. And without them, uh, we, we wouldn't be here. And so we're just grateful of them. We just uh, uh, want to uh, say that and, uh, and just say we love them as well. Father, be with us as we go through the further of our servants service, uh, we hope and pray that everything we do be a pleasing and acceptable to thy sight. We love you, we thank you, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Now we'll have two song selections by our song leader, Kelvin Kreiner. Thank you. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace in the mansion by and blessed. He'll prepare for us a place when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing there will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. While we walk the pilgrim's pathway, clouds will overspread the skies. But when traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a sigh. 
when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory. Let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of him in glory will the toys of life repay when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Sometimes when misgivings darken the day and the faith light I cannot see, I ask my dear Lord to brighten the way. He whispers sweet peace to me. He whispers sweet peace to me. He Whisper sweet peace to me, and this blessed word, he strengthens my soul. He whispers sweet peace to me. I could not go on without him, my Lord. The world would away my soul. He is worthy, the lamb, and brightens the way. It points to the heavenly goal. He whispers sweet peace to me. He Whisper sweet peace to me, and this blessed word, he strengthens my soul. He whispers sweet peace to me, he speaks through his words, assurance he gives, I'm his and I know he's mine. And safe in the fall, my soul he will keep. I'll rest in his love divine. He whispers sweet peace to me. He whispers sweet peace to me. And this blessed word. Strengthens my soul. He whispers sweet peace to me. He whispers sweet peace to me. God is whispering right now in your life. And if you are feeling any distraught, uh, discouraged, down, uh, you've lost hope, let Jesus whisper sweet peace to your ears and your heart today. Thank you again for being with us. Now, if you don't mind, we'll go to another portion of our worship service, which is scripture reading. Uh, if you have your Bibles, follow me, if you will, in chapter and in Titus, the book of Titus, in chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Titus, chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Amen. And the Bible says, I'll be reading out the King James Version. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. The aged women, likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given too much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. May the Lord 
bless the hearers and doers of his word. If you don't mind, please go to with me and, and God in prayer again. We're going to go to meditate on the goodness of God. As I always told you, there's always something you ought to meditate uh, and that, that God has been good to you this week. And so just, just meditate on that and say thank you, Lord, for that blessing that he has brought to your life this week. And remember all the goodness he has brought to you as well. Let us meditate. Amen. Father God, again, thank you for this day. Thank you for, again, bringing us again together and on this special occasion where we're, where we're about to worship our, uh, you in spirit and truth. And, and uh, just today, as we, as a, as a country, remember our mothers, even uh, through the <clears throat> midst of this turmoil and this epidemic that we are dealing with, and we know that there are a lot of parents, mothers, single mothers, and, and mothers just as a whole, who are dealing with this as, as, as they are trying to uh, nurture their children and, and uh, trying to educate them as well and, and also trying to be uh, wives and, and single mothers. And, and we just ask that you intervene in their lives and, and bless them and, uh, uh, and just guard their hearts in Christ Jesus. Uh, Father, just uh, be with us as a church as a whole, as a universal body, as well as collectively. Uh, be with us here at the Church of Christ, uh, Cloverland, that we meet here on this corner. We just ask that everything we do and are about to do be pleasing in your sight and that uh, we always come to you and seek your wisdom and knowledge uh, uh, to a, uh, and follow it uh, in, in the best way we know how. Father, be with your men servants. I pr proclaim your word today. Uh, guard my heart and mind and uh, just forgive me if I've done anything contrary to your word. Do not hold it against me on the day of judgment. Uh, Father, again, we thank you. We love you. We're proud of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, if you are there in your Bible, as we're going to begin our lesson this, this morning, I want to talk about on the title, The Wonderfulness of Motherhood. The Wonderfulness of Motherhood. Church, today, we are here to worship the Lord and honor our mothers. Not only are we commanded to honor our, our mothers, it is also the this, uh, this sensible and, and loving thing to do. Am I right? And so many of us here today who's watching me uh, uh, virtual wish we still had our mothers living so we could honor them and, and remember them and love them. A six-year-old boy separated uh, from his mother in the supermarket began to call to call frantically for, for Martha, Martha, Martha. And, and that, that was his mother's name, church. And, and she came running to him quickly. But, but honey, she admonished, you shouldn't call me Martha. I'm mother to you. Yes, yes, I know, he answered, church. But, but the store is full of mothers. See, our world, church, is, is full of, of mothers. But we have only one mother who is special should be, at least, in your life, but, but must always be in your life. You see, there is no one like our mothers, brothers and sisters, and no one can take the place of our mothers. Someone wrote, you, you've turned into a mom when you, you've automatically doubled not everything you tie. You find yourself humming the Barney song as you, as you do the dishes. You hear a baby cry in the, in the grocery store, and you start to gently sway back and forth, back and forth. However, your children are either at school or long gone. And you actually, you, you actually start to, to like the smell of strained carrots mixed with applesauce. And you spend a half an hour, church, uh, searching for your, your sunglasses only to have your teenager say, Mom, you, who don't, who, why don't you wear the ones you pushed up on your head? See, you're, you're out, or uh, what about this one? You're out for a nice romantic meal with your husband, enjoying some, some real adult conversation, when suddenly you realize that you reached over and started to cut up a steak. See, things our mother taught us. So I, I just want to reminisce today. Things our, our mother taught us. My mother taught me, church, uh, to appreciate a job well done. What do you mean, preacher? Well, she would say, if you're going to kill each other, do it outside. I just finished cleaning. My mother taught me, uh, me also about religion. 
She said, you better pray that they will come out of my carpet. She also taught me, my mother taught me about time travel. And she said, if you don't straighten up, I'm going to knock you into the what? Middle of next week. You know that one. My mother also taught me logic, church. She said, because I said so, that's why when I would ask a question. My mother taught me foresight. She would say, make sure you're, 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 you wear clean underwear in case you had, you're in an accident. My mother taught me irony. She said, keep crying, I'll give you something to what? Cry about. She also taught me this, uh, about science and, and osmosis. She said, shut your mouth and eat your supper. Come on now, I'm talking to somebody. My mother taught me about stamina. What do you mean? She said, you, you'll sit there until all that spinach is gone. She also taught me about, about weather. The room of, uh, of yours looked, like, looked as if a tornado went through it. She taught me about the circle of life. I brought you into this world, and I can take you out. Hey, man, come on now. My mother taught me about behavior modification. Stop acting like your father. My mother taught me also about envy. She said, there are millions of less fortunate children in this world who don't have wonderful parents like you do. My mother taught me about anticipation. Just wait until I get home. You know what that means. Come on now. She also taught me about receiving. You're going to get it when you, I get home. My mother also taught me about medical science. If you don't stop crossing your eyes, the wind will change you, and you will stay like that. She also taught me, church, uh, about how to become an adult. If you don't eat your, your vegetables, you'll never grow up. I remember that when I was a little young child. And then she taught me about genetics. You act just like your father. See, there are so many things I can keep talking about our mothers, and you, I know you may be laughing as, I, as you hear these sayings, and you, you know that you heard your mother say, what about this one? You, what about the roots your mama taught you? Shut the door behind you. Don't you think you were born in a barn? My mother taught me about wisdom. When you get to be my age, you'll understand. My mother also taught me about justice. One day you'll have kids, and I hope they turn out just like you. See, on, on Mother's Day, Ladies and gentlemen, we can't say enough good things about our mothers, but we'll try. And God help us if we don't. Happy Mother's Day. I want to say that again. So take your Bibles and, and turn with me, if you're already there, please, to, to Titus chapter 2. And we're going to begin reading in just a moment in verse 1. And I want to speak to you on this subject, the, the, the wonderfulness of motherhood. The, the wonderfulness of motherhood. Now, here's what God's word says in Titus chapter 2. Paul is speaking to Titus, and he says this. He says, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. What is that, Titus? Paul tells, him, uh, Paul tells Titus that is, this is basic, that the age or the age men be sober. That they grave, uh, temperate, uh, temperate, sound in faith, in, in charity, and, and in patience. That the aged woman, likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to too much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Church, God Almighty, because he loves us, created the home, and, 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 and intends for the home to be the sweetest place on earth and the nearest place to heaven. I've told you before, church, uh, that Jesus is the greatest home builder. Satan is the greatest home wrecker. We have today, and it sends my heart, we have today failing fathers and militant mothers. Do you know there is a satanically inspired war on the family today? A, a war, listen to me, a war on marriage and a war on motherhood itself 
and church, this vile egg has been hatched in the incubator of hell, and it is a part of Satan's master. Listen, I come to tell you this morning, my, it is a part of Satan's master in his mind to enslave human souls to damn the race. Now, when I, I talk about woman's liberation, I know that there is a lot of uh, controversy, and I know there is a lot of philosophy, listen to me, and a lot of ideas, and if I know much about preaching today, there'll be some who won't like what I have to say this morning, and perhaps some of you will get angry at me, and if you do that, that's all right. You, you can email me, you can call me, or you can leave a message at, uh, below our video and apologize to me after the service, and I'll forgive you. <laughs> but, I, but, but, but I want us to, to see, dear friend, that this issue is not going to be settled, as far as I'm concerned, apart from the Word of God. Now, not apart from preachers' philosophy, or some politicians' philosophy, or some feminist idea, but the Word of God. Now, I know, as you know, as you know that I know, that there have, there are some, some honest grievances that women have today. I, I think we, we, we've all come to see that, that equal work ought to, ought to receive equal pay. Am I right about it? And, and husbands ought to realize that their wives are not slaves. Let me say that again. I don't think you heard me back there. And husbands ought to realize that their wives are not slaves. And so many of we men have failed with our chauvinistic attitudes toward women. See, I, I heard about a man, church, uh, who came back to, to South Sea Island and after war uh, in, the, in the Pacific, uh, and, he, and he asked one of the natives, uh, on those South Sea Islands, and uh, he said, uh, has there been any difference after the Americans were over here than before the Americans were over here in the way that you treat your women? Oh, he, he said, church, uh, there's been a great difference. He said, remember before you came over here how the man used to sit on the donkey and the woman would walk behind. said, we no longer do that. Now the women walk in front, landmines, you know. I know we men, church, are, are guilty of a, of a lot of things. And I will try, not try to defend the, the excesses in the, the sins of, of chauvinistic males. But let's see what, what God's, God has given the women. Turn with me now to, to Genesis, if you don't mind, to Genesis chapter 2. And look in your Bibles in verse 18 for a moment. Genesis chapter 2 and in verse 18. Look, if you will, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. And let's go all the way back to the Garden of Eden and let's see how God made things to be in the very beginning. All right? Now, this is before sin came into the world. This is not some, some judgment upon women. It's not because God is trying to get even or keep women in their place. This is the reason I said this, this place, this place that I'm about to, to take you in a moment, my first point, it is a glorious place for our mothers. It is a glorious place for our women. And the Bible says there, and the Lord God said it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him, watch this, a uh, help me for him. Now, God's plan, listen to me, ladies. God's plan for women was this. She was created to be a helper that is fit for him or a helper that is met for him. That is, she is to compliment. He's not complimented without a woman. She is to compliment that which is missing in man. Come on now. And, and she is to be, church, listen, to uh, 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 his helper. She is to be his completer. And the Bible tells us again, if you're taking notes, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 9, that the woman was created for who? For the man. 
See, the woman was created for man. And in the home, the woman is to be under the direction and leadership of the man. Now look, if you will, with me please, in, in Genesis chapter 3 and, and verse 16. God said to the woman, after sin had came into the world, he says this unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow shall, uh, and thy conception. In sorrow shall thy bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now again, I, I want to tell you that I, I did not write this, church. I, I just read it, and it comes from the word of God. Then I want you to turn with me, please, in the New Testament and, and, uh, to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And again, let's see what the word of God has to say. We'll explain some of this and interpret it, but right now I'm just laying the groundwork. Stay with me now. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3, look what the Bible says. It says, but I will have you to know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Now notice the woman was made to be a help meet for man. The Bible says that the woman was created for man, we just saw. And the Bible says that thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Then also the Bible says that the head of the woman is the man. Now turn to Ephesians chapter 5. And look with me, please, in, in verse 22. I'm going somewhere with this. Stay with me. It's no wonder, church, that, that Paul said here in Ephesians, verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 22, Wives, submit who? Yourselves unto your own, not to somebody else, unto your own husbands, as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Now, as Christ is the Savior of the body, called the church, the husband is to be to, uh, his wife's Savior and protector. Not that he can save her in a, in a spiritual sense, but he is to be to her uh, in the material world what Jesus is to us in the spiritual world. Mm, I'm talking to you man now. You don't get quiet on me, husbands. You see, and, and notice that therefore in verse 24, he says, therefore I, as the church is subject under Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. Not a few things. In everything. You wonder why your house is turned down. Because you have not followed the ordinances of God. It is simply instructed right here. I just given, given you the blueprint, ladies and gentlemen. Now, what is the glorious place for our woman, women today? What is the glorious place for you, mother, that is watching me this morning? Well, the glorious place that God has given a woman is this. This, that she's to stand by a man's side. She is to be the help meet that God has given to him. This, is, does, this does not mean, as I've said so many times, that a woman is inferior to a man. We'll point that out later on. But let me say this, uh, the God-appointed place for you mothers, for you women, not the, the assignment of a preacher, but God's assignment. Now let's uh, go to a second point if we might. I, I talked about a glorious place. M women, you have a glorious place. I, I just want to say you have a glorious place given to you by God. And let, let, but I want to talk to you about a grievous problem. We talked about the glorious place, but let's show you the grievous problem we have in our world today. You see, we, we have today women who do not want the God-assigned place. They don't want the God-assigned place that I've just given you. They feel that somehow that de, uh, de, 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 uh, denigrates women, denigrates that, uh, women today, that it, it puts women down that it speaks of women as being not as valuable as a man. 
that he speaks of women somehow as being less than equal with men, which is totally and absolutely, as I'm going to show you in a moment, ludicrous. But what happens when a woman rebels against the God-appointed place that God has given to her, what does she do, preacher? Well, well, first of all, she sins against her God. Now, remember this chain of command here. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, if you don't mind, and look in verse 3 again. The Bible says, but I will have you to know that the head of every man is Christ. And the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Now, God has a chain of command. Here's God the Father. God the Son, the man, the woman. Now all sin is ultimately a sin against authority. And so rebellion, church, is the root of all sin. And when a woman say, I will not take the God-assigned place, that woman at that time expresses rebellion. We're never more like the devil when we rebel against the God-assigned place. I've come to tell you this morning. We're never more like the Lord Jesus when we submit to God's assigned place. Now, God has given us a chain of command, and church, without a chain of command, we could not function in this world. Spiritually, we could, not, we could not function. God the Father, God the Son, the man, the woman, the church could not function. Now, God has given man, as I've told the brothers here at Coverland, God has given man a real booty. And in the Bible it says, if a man do not take care of his household, he is worse than an infidel. He is he's an unbeliever, the Bible says. And so the man is, uh, is held accountable for his wife and children. That's a sobering thought. I'm saying spiritually, I, I cannot function without a chain of command. In the church, we cannot function, church, without a chain of command. In the government, we cannot function without a chain of command. Now, what I'm saying is, God says, in the spiritual realm, there's a chain of authority. Father, son, man, woman. In the church, there is a chain of authority as well. In the government, there is a chain of authority. And in the home with children and parents, there is the same chain of authority. So go back to, to Ephesians, if you don't mind, with me in chapter 6. And look here for just a moment. We spoke of this morning, but let's look at it again. Children, it says, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with the promise. Now, God extends the chain of command, not only from the husband to the wife, but from the parents down to the children. Oh, say amen if you want to. Now, I want to say that, that, that submission to authority does not mean infer, 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 in, in, inferiority. Now, you, you think of these different illustrations I've given you this morning. Do you think that you're inferior to me because I'm the minister? Of course not. Do you think I, that I'm inferior to a policeman because I, I stop when he says stop and go when he says go? Of course not. Do you think that a child is inferior to his parents because the child obeys his parents? Of course not. Do you see where I'm going with this? Here's the capstone. Do you think that God, the Son, is inferior to God, the Father who thought it not robbery to be equal with God? Of course not, church. If you know anything about Christian theology, you know that the basic prime tenet of our faith is the full deity of Jesus Christ, co-equal and co-eternal co with God the Father. And yet the Bible says, Brother Kreiner, that the head of Christ is God. And God the Father is the head of Christ, the Son. Now, folks, listen to me. Don't let anybody ever tell you that when you submit, you submit because you're inferior to the one above you. And I think that's the problem we're having in our homes today. Not so, not so. Now, there's when a, now, when a woman, when a woman rebels against God's plan, she is rebelling 
against the God of that plan. And so she sins against God. But not only does a woman who rebels sin against God, brothers and sisters, she also then is going to sin against her nature. I don't know, but I, I tell you one thing that I do know. That a woman ought to look like a woman, and a man ought to look like a man. Now, when you come up from behind them, you ought to have no difference telling who's and what's what. Amen? Don't get quiet on me today now. That's right. I said that now. I mean, what does the scripture say? That, that a woman ought not to have a mannish look. Her hair is giving her for a reason. It's a, it's a glory, it's a sign, brothers and sisters, of her submission to God. Now, if you don't do this, dear lady, not only are you going to sin against God, but you're going to sin against your nature. You're going to be a misfit. And when you sin against your God and you sin against your nature, ladies, then you're going to sin against your welfare. That's the third thing I want to talk about today. You see, God put women on a pedestal, and God gave, a, gave men a direct command to protect women. I heard about a factory that got off, at, uh, and one woman got on the bus, and, and the factory whistle blew, and a man was sitting there reading a newspaper church, and this woman was standing there in her blue jeans holding the strap and, and worked alongside of her there, there in the factory, worked alongside that man. And she had, she had never, never made any move to get up and give her, the man never made a move to, give, to get up and give her his seat. And after a while, church, she, she looked at him with a, with a sneer and said, it looks like you could get up and give a lady a seat. He looked up for, for, uh, up for a moment and he, and he said, you dress like a man, you work like a man, you smoke like a man, you cuss like a man, you stand like a man, uh, and there is that lack of respect, church, that is not supposed to be there. There is supposed to be in a man an inbreed desire to protect women as we're going to see later on. And a woman sins against her welfare and mark it down while some may temporarily, temp, uh, temporarily prosper as a whole when women, church, when get what they want, what they think they want, they will not want what they get. Church, but let, now let's get, come back just real quickly. And let's come back all around. And I know it's taken me a long time to get, get here, but, but see, sin, sin is, is a terrible thing. She sins against her family. Now, come back to the next text that I, I started with uh, there in Titus chapter 2 and see what God's word says here in Titus chapter 2 and look at it again. God says in, in Titus chapter 2 that the older woman, women rather, ought to, are to teach the younger women this, chapter 2 verse 4, that they may teach the young women to be, be sober. And the word sober here, church, means that they're to teach them to be responsible. Older women ought to teach younger women to be responsible, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet. That means sensible, chaste, that means pure, keepers at home, good, obedient to what? To their own husbands. So many of us wives, we got so many husbands, we're trying to, can't keep up with one. He says to your own husband that the word of God be not blasphemed. Now, that's what God says, ladies and gentlemen. We have this little thing today, you know. It's 11 o'clock. Do you know where your children are? We need to change it, church. We need to say it's 11 o'clock. Do you know where your parents are? Or oh, you'll get that when you get in the car. Do you know where your mama is, young man? Do you know where your mama is, young lady? What God is saying here is that it's not God's plan that, that some daycare take care of your children. Husbands need a wife, children need a mama, and what happened is when we put great, great numbers of women, that, that statistics in today's paper about the number of women in the workforce. Now, this is something I, I hold hard to, dear to my heart, and just listen to me. In just a few years now, it has increased, church, by, by 50%. What happens is this. 
Well, it's so big to tell you what happens. I can hardly tell you all the damage, Brother Kleiner, that, that is being done in the psyche of, of kids to the whole moral scope of things, the divorce rate, the, the, to the, the psyche of kids to the whole, to the unemployment, all this that we're dealing with. I've said it before and I'll say it again. My hat goes off. My heart goes out. To any woman, church, listen to me, lady, listen to me. Any woman who must work to put food on her table, who must work to put clothes on the back of her children, who must work to meet the recognized necessities of life, to those who work only for the, for the pride of work or those who work only for the luxuries that the money can bring or those who work only for the so-called self-fulfillment and neglect to having babies, if they could have them or in neglect of taking care of their children and they have, have had them, hey, folks, that's a big deal for me. That's a, that's a big, bad deal. It's a tragedy beyond compare. Church, and again, uh, don't, don't be angry with me if you, if you have to work. Don't think I'm putting it down, and I'm not. That's not what I'm saying. I love you, and I pray for you, ladies, all the time. Uh, uh, for you, the time will come when you have not to do these things. But I'm saying this, dear friend, that when a woman does not see God's plan, what she does is this. She sinned against her God. Then, then, then she sins against her nature. And then she sins, brothers and sisters, against her welfare. And then she sins against her own family. And let me wrap this thing up by saying not only is there a glorious position for our mothers today. You have a glorious position. Not only there is a grievous problem, as I talked to you, showed you the problem we have in our lives, in our marriages, and where is our mothers raising children, but there is a gracious plan. See, there is a glorious position for our mothers to submit to their own husbands. Let the husband be the head of the family. There is a grievous problem that the world we live in today is, is changing that, that plan. But there's a gracious plan, and God is waiting for you to be a part of it. Wonderfulness of motherhood, I'm telling you. There's a gracious plan. Let me show you what God's plan is, if you don't mind. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7. And if you ladies think that I'm talking down to you, I want to tell you, I'm just getting ready to talk down to your husband, to the men in your life. I believe that the problem in today's society is not the women. I believe that the problem clearly and plainly is with the men. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7. And look what the Bible says. Now, while the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3 that a woman is to be in subjection to her own husband, the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 7, he says, Likewise, you husbands dwell with them according to, to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. I preach long enough. Listen to me, church. Listen to me. Where I live long enough. Now I'm some thirty-nine years old, amen. But I live long enough. I counsel enough to come to this conclusion that if a home is wrong, generally it is because the man is wrong. Don't get quiet on me today. I have yet to see, in all of my experience, a marriage where the husband loved God fervently and purely at, 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 at marriage whose wife and children did not come along with him. Now, I've seen many a wife come to church along with their children, and no husband is behind them. He's at home drinking a beer and watching NFL games. I've seen many a wife and many a children who love the Lord, whose father and husband would not follow. But I have yet to see, I cannot give you chapter and verse this morning. I'm just talking about experience now. I'm talking about my observation. I have yet to see where a man said it uh, and it meant it lovingly as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord whose wife and children did not follow him. Now, there are, there are husbands owe three things according to this verse to their wives. 
Husbands, listen to me. You may have a, you may give a, your, your wife a treat today, but Mother's Day, by learning these three things. The very first thing that you owe to your wife is provision. They are, you are to provide for her, brother. You are to provide for your wife. The husband is to be the breadwinner. When God gave the woman to you, privilege of standing by the man's side, and he told her to submit to you, God also gave to the man the assignment to earn the bread by the sweat of his brow. And the husband owes to the wife provision. You see, he, he's to love his wife as Christ loved the church, and Christ provides our every need. Am I right about it? He said you ought to have the same love for your wife. He's to love his wife as Christ loved the church. But not only does he owe his wife provision, he owes his wife provision, he owes his wife protection. Dwell with them according to knowledge, the Bible says, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, brothers. Now, the reason that, when, that women's liberation is so wrong is that a woman does not, not, de, does not uh, need to be liberated from the protection of a male. Oh, you follow me this morning? He is to protect the woman. If danger were to come to Brandy, I would want to put my, myself between Brandy and that danger. I don't believe in those realms that we are equal. I believe that God made her physically and psychologically with a dependent nature. Now, it is true that she'll outlive me by seven years if statistics hold true, amen. I, I've never really been able to, to figure out why they're, they're called the weaker sex when they outlive us. But, but I think I know that the weakness of the stronger sex is the weakness of the stronger sex for the weaker sex. Hmm. I think that, that, that that's what messes the whole thing up, brothers and ladies and gentlemen. But we're, we're here not only to be providers, brothers, but to be protectors. But not only does the man, is the man required to show provision and protection, but according to this verse, and here's the key, to show partnership. Can I close with partnership? He is to show partnership. That doesn't mean that if a wife is to submit to the husband, that the husband is the boss of the home. Mm. You didn't like that, did you, man? No, he and his wife are co-partners in the home. Look again, likewise, he said, look what the Bible said, likewise, you wives, dwell with them. Dwell together. Togetherness, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife, as unto the weaker vessel. Now watch this, as being heirs together of the grace of life. We are heirs together. My wife, Brandy, and me, we are heirs together, even though she get on my last nerves, and, and I get on her last nerves, amen. Pray for us, amen. But I love her dearly. Happy Mother's Day to you, baby, well, by the way. We are heirs together. There's to be this togetherness. Now, in our home, Brandy knows that I'm the head of the home. If she were, if she were here, she, she probably would think of, of some time, but, but I cannot think of a time ever, maybe one or two. But I, I can't even think of one in my mind now, ladies and gentlemen, where I have, I have ever had to say, honey, because I'm the head of the house, this is the way it is going to be. I can't think, brothers and sisters. I'll tell you why. Because we've always prayed. We've always talked. Not always. I'm lying if I said it. Not always, but we've talked. We've always shared. And if we disagree, we back off and come again, and back off and come again, and back off and come again until we get it right. And until someone come, until we all come together as heirs under the grace of life. But, but Brandy knows, and I know, if proof comes to shove and a decision has to be made, then I have to make it. And I have to bear that responsibility because she knows, as I know, that anything with no head is dead. 
and anything with two heads is a freak. And the man is the head of the house. It can't be two heads. There's only one. And if you have a two-headed monster in your house, no wonder why that house is tore up, because it's just a freak. Amen, somebody. Let me close. Anything with no head is dead, and anything with two heads is a freak. But the Bible says that we are to be heirs together of the grace of light. Now, she is a helpmeet. That is, she is a partner. And that means that as a partner, she is to be not to be excluded. We're to have no secrets from each other. Do you know that there are husband, that, that, that there are, are wives that this is an average uh, uh, Congo who don't even know how much money their husband, husband makes? They don't even know what's in the bank account. They don't even know where the papers are, all, all the things are. No, dear friend, the Bible says we are to be heirs together of the grace of life. And what some people call a nosy wife is really only a woman seeking her rightful place. Some of you fellas think you're, you're God's gift to women. A man who brags he's never made a mistake has a wife who did. I want to tell you something. The problem in the world today is men who fail to be men of God and love their wives as Christ has, has also loved the church and gave himself for it. And most women don't mind being in submission to a man who loves her enough to die for her and shows it. See, the devil sold us a bill of goods, folks, didn't he? And the Bible teaches there's a, there's a wonderfulness of motherhood. There's a wonderfulness of motherhood, ladies. There's a glory to femininity. The Bible does not teach that submission is inferiority. And we're not going to put this city back together. We're not going to put our world back together till we get back to God's intentions and God's plan. Thank you for our message today. We love you. We thank you. Happy Mother's Day to our ladies. Let us pray. Thank you, Father God. We thank you for this day. Thank you for your scriptures. Thank you for the message today, the wonderfulness of motherhood. And I'm just hoping that we get back to your plan, the glorious plan, the glorious rightful place of the woman. We saw the grievous problem, and we saw the gracious plan you, play, you put in place. And as I said, men, let's be more accountable. Let's, let's, let's listen to what the Holy Spirit says in our heart. And let's love our women as God has promised to us, as, as Christ loved the church. We want to say again, say, Father God, thank you for this message. Thank you for all who have joined us today. And be with our ladies. Be with our mothers all across this world. We love them dearly. We thank you for all that they've done in our lives. Thank you for this worship service, oh God. Thank you for all who have attended to today. If there's anything that, they, they, that they've done uh, contrary to your word, we ask that you blot it out of the sea of life and bring it to remembrance no more. Forgive them for they've done anything by word, thought, or deed contrary to your word. We love you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you again for joining us today. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. You've got to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You've got to repent, confess, believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Be baptized for the remission of your sins. Remain faithful until death. You shall see the crown of life. If there's anything we can do to help you, don't hesitate. Come in below. Subscribe to our, our YouTube channels. Again, follow us. We love you. Again, thank you from the Cloverland Church of Christ. Why did my Savior come to earth and to the humble go? Why did he choose a lonely bird because he loved me so, he loved me so, he loved me so. His precious life for me, for me, because he loved me so. Well,
go to another portion of our worship service, which is communion. I ask that you, you, you change your thoughts and your minds now and concentrate on the, the goodness of God and him sending his son to the sin-sick world to hang, bleed, and die on our behalf. Clear your hearts and minds and thoughts so that you will not be condemned as you partake of the Lord's Supper. And the fire, we'll find this in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, where it tells us, I shall read, you shall hear, upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, read to the point on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. The heart and mind we ought to have when we participate in the Lord's Supper, you'll find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verses 23 and following, I shall read and you hear, for the Bible says this, I receive the Lord, that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and, take, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye, as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. And as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and are asleep. Let us pray. Dear Father God, we again thank you for this day. Thank you for the worship service. Now as we partake of the Lord's Supper, we ask that we clear our hearts and minds as we partake of the bread that represents his body. We ask that we take it with a pure heart and pure mind, not condemning ourselves. We ask that we take of the cup that represents the shed blood for the remission of our sins. We ask that we take it with a pure heart and pure mind as well, not condemning ourselves. We ask that you bless us and continue to strengthen us in the inner man through the Holy Spirit. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now you may be partake of the Lord's Supper. Now we're going to our giving. And you'll find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, in verses 1 and 2. It says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches in Galatia, that even so do ye. And upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay them in store, as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. You'll find the heart and mind we ought to have when we give back to the Lord what he blessed us with in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Verses 6 and following. He said, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall also reap sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall also reap bountifully. Every man according to, to as he prospers in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. You may give at this time. You can do that on our website at www.cloverlandcoc.com under giving. And also, you can do that by bringing your, your giving up to the building. Again, we want to thank you for joining us in our worship service today. Hope to see you next time.